It's good to be with you once again. One of my great frustrations in my life is how often I'm involved in discussion or conversation with others about government. You see how that sat when I mentioned that? One of the reasons I'm so frustrated about it is about 95% of the time, our conversations are based purely upon opinion and nothing on fact. That's where our conversation sits. And just on that alone means that we should not talk about government, really. But what's even worse for me is about 99% of the time, after those conversations are done, I'm not left with joy and I don't feel closer to God. In fact, ask yourself this. The last time you talked about government, or think about previous conversations you've had with government, did you leave going, I'm glad I had that conversation? Did you go, wow, I just feel closer to Jesus? Most likely not. Because with our conversations, there are often grumbling and complaints, even when justified, and they don't lead us to joy, and they don't lead us to drawing closer to God. And we wish, I imagine most of us, that we just wouldn't have to talk about government anymore. But here's the thing, and I think we all know it. We all know that we are going to speak about government. At our dinner tables, with colleagues, we're going to talk about it. And just in case you doubt that, this afternoon, when your electricity goes off, (laughs) you're going to have a conversation about government, aren't you? Even if it's just with yourself. So if we're going to talk about government, why not let the scriptures be the ones that inform us about how we should talk about government? So turn with me into the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2 and verse 13, and let us see what the Lord says about government. 1 Peter, chapter 2 and verse 13, which says this, be subject For the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. I've had the privilege of going to a number of sporting events in my life and sitting in stadiums. And and I enjoy watching the sport. I enjoy being amongst the crowd. But one of the sad things that I often see at stadiums is when I see a father and a son. Not that that's sad. But I I see the crowd cheering, but then I also see the crowd jeering. And what happens is you see the father shouting expletives at the opposing team, at the opposing fans. And what ends up happening? That kid does the exact same thing. So now think about that with regards to how you speak about government. When you speak about it, do you think your children are lifting them up in praise, honoring God, or do you think it's tearing down? What are you telling others by how you speak and act towards government? Because it is having an impact on others as well as yourself. And as I think as we look at this passage, we need every single one of us to know how to honor our government. Not only so that we can obey this passage, but also to give us a bit of sanity in this life when it comes to government. We need to learn how to respond to government, how to honor them, how to submit to them so that we may obey this passage and so that we can go out into this world 
and have peace as we think about government. And so that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at this idea. This is the subject for today, how to honor the government with your citizenship as you follow Christ. You're going to look at how to honor the government with your citizenship as we continue in our series, A Life of Significance. So the first thing that we need to look at is who are we supposed to submit to? Who are we supposed to honor as we look at this passage? Now, I'm sure for many of you, as for myself, as I look at this passage, I see it, and my first thought is going, yeah, but does this really apply to our governments today? Or maybe you'd be saying, yeah, but I think this applies when you have a good Christian government in place. Or you might be saying, yeah, but this doesn't mean I need to submit in all things. It's intriguing to me how often we use that phrase or something like it, yeah, but, when it comes to government. And it's intriguing to me how often what follows that phrase is something negative, never positive. But as you look at your passage this morning, you will notice it does not say, yeah, but. It doesn't give an exception. There's no exception clause in here. It says to us that we are to submit to every human institution. But now, as we think of this idea, we may go, well, I also see what it says in verse 14. It tells me what the role of government is. The role of government is to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. And then you think, well, our government doesn't do this very well. Maybe some of you are saying, our government doesn't do this at all. And in fact, as you look at governments outside our borders, you'll say they all fall short in this regard. They don't punish those who do evil. They don't praise those who do good. In fact, quite often, they do the opposite. Yet, as Peter wrote this, he says, submit to every institution. And when you look at that word, he means every institution single one, all of them, whether they are good or whether they are evil, you are to submit to them. And the reason I can say this is because if you look a little bit further down into the passage where we're going to go in a couple of weeks, when it speaks about those who are in household servitude, it says this, that they are to submit to their masters, whether those masters are good or evil. Their job is to submit. So in the same way, we are to submit to our government, whether they are good or evil, whether they follow through on what they're supposed to do or not, whether you voted for them or not, you are to submit to them. But this, for me, as I'm sure for you, still does not sit well. Because then you go, well, maybe this was more for Peter's time. Peter doesn't understand the governments that we have. He hasn't seen our modern-day leaders. Surely it should be different for us. And I agree with you. Peter probably didn't know our governments. But I think a good argument can be made that his government was far, far worse. The emperor at that stage for Peter was an emperor by the name of Nero. I'm sure some of you know that name. But let me give you a couple of highlights of Nero's rule. Nero raped and killed members of his own family. Brothers, sisters, and mother. Even more so than that, he killed multitudes of Roman citizens. And one of the first great Christian persecutions was happening through Nero, in which he blamed the Christians for a fire that went into Rome, which most hold that he probably caused himself. And so lining the streets of Rome, as we think about that idea, all roads lead to Rome, were crucifixes of Christians. This was the emperor in Peter's time. And yet he still says, 
submit. What's even worse is that under Nero's time, it is most likely Peter was martyred for his faith and yet still calls us to submit to our government. Did Peter vote for Nero? No. Did Peter vote for any of his governors? Most likely not. And yet he still calls Christians to submit. To submit, and as you see later in the passage there, to honor the emperor. And for me, this is difficult. How do we do this? What attitude do I need to have in order to even make this possible? What is the attitude I need to take in order to submit to a government like this? Well, that is what we're going to look at next. We're going to look at the idea of an attitude that we should have, an attitude that should come from freedom. Now, for most of us who have seen the word submit before or be subject, we'll know that word. And so we'll say, Dave, submit doesn't equal obedience. So I don't need to obey my government in everything, and you'll be correct. Submit does not mean blind obedience. But with that, I think it speaks to our heart, doesn't it? When we see the word submit in Scripture, what is our first thought? What is the exception here? How do I not need to submit? What are the things I don't need to obey? We see the word submit and we think of the negative rather than the positive. We do not see it as an opportunity to do good, but rather how can we get away with it? How do we not need to submit in all things? That is our heart. That is my heart. I, I had a friend recently who immigrated to another country. And they love the country that they're in, but they says it's quite hectic there. One of the reasons it's quite hectic is that they say citizens will rebuke and report you even if you cross the road in the wrong place. Now, when I hear that, I'm left a little bit uneasy. I go, I don't think I can live in that country because of the way I live now. And how do I live now? I live as one who goes, well, if I'm not caught for it, then I'm fine. And as many of us think, and as I'm sure many of us are, like me, you think, well, I'm not breaking the big laws. It's just the small ones. And to be honest, should some of those even be laws? Really? I had another friend who thought that same way. He thought with the idea of driving, he said, better drivers should have different speed limits. And he classified himself as a better driver. And so he disobeyed the speed limit. That was how he thought. That was how he thought about submission. It was a choice that he could choose however you want. He did not see it as an opportunity to do good. And for each one of us, that's how we need to see this passage. That is how Peter is writing it. It's an opportunity to do good. And the good that I'm talking about is not just merely honoring the emperor or the governor over you. It's honoring God. Because the mature believer understands this. A mature believer understands that as they submit to their government, what they're doing is they're saying, I trust you, God. As they submit to their government, they understand that their God is good and is in control. As they submit to their government, they realize this is a way for me to honor you, Lord. And yes, as we look at the many governments in our world, we may have the question, why does God allow these governments to exist? Why, God? But my job is not to control which government comes in place. My job is not to rule this land. My job as a believer is to honor the government because I'm honoring God as I do so. That is where we need to go as we see this, to see it as an opportunity to do good. And it needs to be driven from an attitude of freedom because that is what Peter is really pushing at. He's not just merely looking at the idea of 
action submission, but he's looking at the idea of freedom within this. And the freedom that he is talking about in verse 16, the freedom that he's talking about is not the freedom that our government gives us, but the freedom that we get as believers. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, and when you believed in that, you received freedom. Because as Peter understands it, and as we see in Scripture, before knowing Christ, you were a slave to sin. And all you could do is but sin. But when you came to know Christ, when you believed in him, you were then given the ability in your will to do good. And that is a freedom that you have been given, given so thus use that freedom to do good. And so go back to verse 16 and see what it says. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Here's the idea. You have been given freedom, and that freedom has been given to you, has been bought by Jesus Christ dying on the cross. How are you using that freedom? Are you using it for the Lord's sake? Look within the passage how often it connects submission to the Lord. Submit for the Lord's sake. As servants of God, submit. The will of God is you would submit. Are we using our freedom as an opportunity to do good? And if I'm honest with myself, I waste my freedom. I often use it to cover up evil. And when I think about waste, I think of this recent conversation I had with someone. I play soccer with a group of guys and uh, as we were sitting after the game, we were having a discussion about many different things. And then one of the guys said to me, he said, ah, do you know this uh, flat earth theory? I was like, yeah. He's like, yeah, it's, it's compelling. I think I believe it. For those of you who don't know what flat earth theory is, it's this idea. It's that people believe that the world is in fact flat and not a globe. Something that was disproven quite a while back, in fact. It's a growing society, but as I heard that, my immediate thought was, what a waste. This person has spent 12 years at school talking about the world being round, has spent an hour in science class every single day talking about the world being round, and is now saying, it's quite compelling, the world could be flat. What a waste. What a waste of an education. And yet, as I think about my own freedom, I think I waste it even more. I waste something that has been bought for me by Jesus Christ's life, and I use it to cover up evil as I think about how I respond to the government. Ask yourself this question. When people look at you, when they look at how you respond to the government, how you deal with things, how you speak about the government, what are their thoughts? When you speak about the government, is your conversation one that is honoring or is it just complaining and grumbling and speaking ill and hurt? When you think about your actions, do you pay your taxes? And if you do pay your taxes, when you pay your taxes, are you taking it as an opportunity to worship God as you honor your government? Or do you go, as you pay them, you go, my government is just going to waste this. When you drive on the road, do you drive as one who is honorable or you drive as a rebel? See, unfortunately, when people look at Christianity, when they look at us, when they look at me, they see more, when I speak about government, what I'm against than what I am for. I do not take my freedom as an opportunity to do good. And so for each one of us, as we think about how we respond to government, we should see it as an opportunity to worship our God as we honor our government. And here's the kicker. Here's the little extra. It's also an opportunity to share the gospel. 
with our lives. Because that's how Peter saw it. You've got to remember Peter's time. In Peter's time, when the Romans looked at Christians, they saw a cult. They saw a group of people worshiping this guy named Jesus, but also a group of people that wouldn't worship the emperor. And so they saw, These are, this is a cult. These are bad citizens. And so as Peter writes this, as he speaks about how we should submit, his thinking is, we have to worship God. We cannot worship the emperor. But let us not rebel on other things and diminish our testimony. Rather, let us use our citizenship as an apologetic, as a proof of how great our Christ is. And so the idea, what Christians did then, is they didn't worship the emperor, but instead, when they spoke to the government, they said, look at us. We pay our taxes. Look at us. We help the needy, the poor in our country. Look at us. We don't act in debaucherous ways. We are different. We are good citizens. And because of that, their group grew. Because as Roman citizens looked, they saw there's something different about these people. They don't worship the emperor, but they do mighty good for our nation. I want to find out. So ask yourself this question. Does our congregation grow? Does Christianity grow in our time as people think about how we submit to our government? In fact, I think it shrinks. Because I think as the world looks in, they see Christians and how they respond to governments throughout the world, and they go, you act just like the rest of us, you hypocrites. I don't want any part of that. We need to understand that submitting to the government is a way in which we can honor God and a way in which we can share the gospel. And so how do we go about doing it? How should we do this? What are the actions that we need to put in place? Well, that's what we need to look at next. And you'll see the answer there in verse 15. It tells us that by doing good, we silence the foolish. That's what we need to do. We need to silence the foolish. So ask yourself this question once again. As you think about how you speak about the government, how you submit to the government, does it silence the foolish or does it make the foolish wise? When you talk at your dinner tables, do people honor God? Or do people go, wow, look how wise I am as I speak ill of the government. We need to silence the foolish by what we do. And so what I'd like to ask each one of us to do this week as we think about how we respond to government, is to first to think about your mouth, and I'd ask you to be silent. When government comes up, be silent. And I'm not saying we should be silent about all things government does, that we shouldn't speak truth into the world. But so often what we do is we open our mouth first and speak hurt and speak ideas of breaking down rather than lifting up. So we need to learn to be silent. And as you are silent, the next thing you should do is then pray. So if someone speaks about the government, be silent and pray for that government. How would that change your perspective? What would that do in your life? Because one of the fools that we need to silence is ourselves. We need to silence this fool because too often we speak foolishness. Imagine the dinner table you're around. Imagine even just yourself. When government came up or when you thought about it, instead of speaking up, you remained silent and prayed and prayed, Father, help our government. Father, help them to do what is right. Father, thank you for the good that they do do. Thank you for the freedom they do give me. Father, help me to do what is right in your eyes. Help me honor you and the government. Imagine what would change in your life. Imagine those around you, how they would look. And as you remain silent, the next thing that you should do is to do what is good. 
by action go out and do what is good, just like Peter and his followers did. Go out, pay your taxes as an opportunity to do worship. Go out and follow the laws of the land. Go out and help those in need. Think about Johannesburg and go, I'm going to be a good citizen. I'm going to help the needy. It's great that we have Martha coming up today. One of the ways in which you can help the needy is by speaking about justice and mercy and seeing how you can partner with helping those in need in our country. Because once again, as people look in then and they see how you respond to government, they see someone who not only honors the government, but someone who is doing good in the city. And is that not attractive towards Christianity? Is that not what Jesus Christ did? Is that not who we should be? Let us honor our government in that way. Be silent and do what is good. And as one final image to grab hold of, to think about that. Think about Jesus Christ, who when he was confronted by government, who were accusing him of doing evil when he had not done, submitted to that government and to their law, even to death going on the cross and dying. And the amazing thing for me is while Jesus is on the cross and Romans are killing him and others are killing him and Pilate has committed him to execution, what does Jesus do? Does he shout out curse words? Does he speak against those? No, what he says is this. Forgive them for they do not know. Imagine if that was our response as a royal priesthood, as representatives of Christ here on earth. If our response was when we think about our government, as we think about their salvation, we say, forgive them, Father, for they do not know. Help me to show them by my life. What type of Christian would we be then? And what type of country will we have then? if we can be good citizens who honor the government for our Lord's sake. Let us close in prayer. Father, forgive me and us for how often we do not submit to this government, for how often we speak ill, for how often we speak hate, for how often we do not even pray for them, Father. Forgive us for trying to take control when you have control, Father. Forgive us for, remember, for forgetting that you, are not, that you are good. Forgive us for not trusting in you. I pray, Father, for each one of us today that we would truly honor this government that we would submit to them as our Christian testimony so that others may come to know you. And Father, we look forward in hope to when your son one day returns and is that righteous government that we so desire. But until that day, Father, help us to honor you. In your son's great name, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, amen. I'd ask you to stand now. And as you stand and sing these songs about God, think about our God is a good God. Our God is a great God. Our God is a God who reigns and has everything in control. And if that is true, then we can submit to the governments that are over us. Let us sing.